Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello, welcome back to Fighting on Film. Now, this week, uh, we are covering another patreon pick so every month as you're probably well aware by now we put up on our patreon uh, four films for our supporting cast members to pick from and this month they had films like 800 pork chop hill i did choose the 800 but i was really expecting uh pork chop to win yeah it was a close run thing i thought that for a moment that 800 was going to win it but it didn't and here we are with robert mitchum and kurt jurgens and we're in a submarine and we're on a, on a destroyer. Yeah, 1957's Enemy Below just won the vote. Um, and this is a call for Patreon members. Um, well, firstly, want to thank you for your patronage. It's much appreciated for keeping the show running. And thank you for voting. Thank you for voting as well. Um, but we are recording with historian Robert Lyman next week. We're going to be doing the um, 1961 film The Long, The Short and The Tall. And we're asking our Patreon uh, members to submit questions for Robert um, about the film or about the war in Burma. If you can tie it into the movie somehow, get your questions in. Um, you'll find that post on the Patreon. And if you're not a Patreon member yet and you want in on the action, then please check out Patreon slash Fighting on Film and you'll find all the information there. So, Matt, do you want to do cast for us this week for The Enemy Below? Certainly. It's, um, well, the two main men, as I've said, are... Robert Mitchum, who plays Captain uh, Morrell, and Kurt Jurgens, who plays uh, Captain Stolberg uh, of the the U-boat, which uh, and it's a cat and mouse game. It's a classic um, destroyer hunting a a U-boat plotline. Robert Mitchum plays the captain of, of the destroyer. He's newly aboard the vessel. Uh, his previous ship has been torpedoed in the North Atlantic, um, and he has quite an interesting background. Um, for the character itself, which we'll go into later on. Everyone knows Robert Mitchum, uh, iconic actor of the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. He was in a number of uh, naval films uh, during the war. He was in Corvette K-225 and Minesweeper. And then he had a bit of a breakout role within the genre in 1944 with 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. Uh, yeah. the, the following year, he was nominated for a Best Supporting Actor in uh, the story of G.I. Joe, which I think is one of your faves, isn't it, Rob? I absolutely adore that movie. I can't wait to cover it. It's, it's yeah, it's fantastic. Mitchum is really great in that. And then uh, throughout the rest of his career, we, he, he had films like Heaven Knows, Mr. Allison, The Hunters, a, a Korean War movie. Uh, the Longest Day he had that uh, cameo as Brigadier General uh, Kota. Uh, Anzio, he was Bull Halsey in Midway. Um, and he was in Breakthrough uh, with Richard Benton in 1979. In the 80s, he was in uh, The Winds of War and uh, War and Remembrance, which were like uh, the kind of uh, equivalent to an HBO miniseries, a big big budget adaptation of some novels. Uh, then we have our other leading man, uh, Kurt Jurgens. This is actually his first uh, Hollywood picture. Yeah. Uh, he'd been in lots of German films, been in lots of European um, productions, but this is his first Hollywood production. He was in a French film called Bitter Victory in 1957 with Richard Burton. He had that, that cameo in The Longest Day. Uh, didn't everyone? Everyone had a cameo in that film. Yeah, it's very true. Uh, he, he was in uh, quite a few um, Italian war movie pictures in the 60s, some spaghetti war movies, uh, the, the the precursor to the Euro War sort of genre. Um, mm. Dirty Heroes in 67, uh, Battle of the Commandos in 69. Uh, he was in the Yugoslavian picture, um, Battle of Naretva. And uh, he reunited with Mitchum in uh, 1979 in Breakthrough. Oh, wow. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and of course, he was in um, Battle of Britain as well in 1969, too. Yes. And then we, we have the, the assorted crews of both the Destroyer and, and, the, and the U-Boat. We've got Theodore Beichel as, uh, as Heine. Uh, uh, Jürgens is second in command. He was a Jewish uh, Austrian actor who emigrated. And the, the most famous films he he was in in terms of war movies are, are things like uh, The African Queen and um, previously he'd been in Above Us the Waves, which is a, a British submarine war movie. Um, yeah, go great on that. David Head uh, David Hedison as Lieutenant Ware or Lieutenant Ware. 
who's the exec officer of uh, of, of the destroyer. Uh, this is his first movie role. Um, he was later in uh, Marines Let's Go. He's probably best known actually for playing uh, Felix Leiter, the CIA agent, in uh, in a couple of Bond movies in the seventies. And then we've got uh, Russell Collins as the Doctor, although Destroyers didn't actually have Doctors. Uh, he was a stage actor, and he'd previously been in uh, Destination Gobi. Kurt Kruger as uh, Von Holm, uh, he had quite an interesting career. He was an emigre um, from Germany. Throughout the 40s, he played lots of lots of German parts in uh, as either uncredited soldier or as, a, as an officer role. So he was in Action in the North Atlantic in 43. He was the German in uh, Sahara, the German officer. Um, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he was in lots of smaller budget films like Tonight We Raid Calais, Hangman Also Die, um, International Squadron, Yankee in the RAF, Non Shall Escape, um, Escape to the Desert, Legion of the Doomed. Lots of great titles. Some of those are actually really good. And some of those are definitely well worth us covering in the future. Yeah, true. Um Frank Albertson played Lieutenant Kane. Biff Elliott played the quartermaster. Biff Elliott was also later in uh, combat. Porkchop Hill, Torpedo Run, and PT-109 for some naval flavor there. Oh, beautiful. Uh, then we had Doug McClaw as Ensign, Ensign Mary, who isn't actually credited, but does have a number of speaking parts. And he's best known for, for the Virginian, which was a, a Western TV serial in the US mm -hmm. and uh, an adaptation of Bo Guest in the 60s. And then one final interesting little snippet is Daryl F. Zanuck, the, the famous producer of numerous films, including The Longest Day, etc. Um, he's seen very briefly in uh, the wardroom briefing scene as a, uh, as a chief. Notes as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that's really interesting, I thought. And then obviously, because the film was actually filmed on a on a US Navy destroyer, a lot of the crew from I know I know you'll probably go into this more with with production and such, but a lot of the crew were actually members of the US Navy. Yeah, yeah. The the chef, isn't it? The the cook. He's he was yeah, uh, yeah. the actual cook of on the, the ship itself. Yeah. Mm. Which is great. I think they actually do. They all do a great job, like because they're just doing what they would do normally. So they don't they're not wooden at all. Yeah, I agree. And if there is any woodenness there, it's probably how you would address an officer. And it's yeah. it's not too out of place for that interaction to be like that, I suppose. Yeah. And it probably works well because obviously in the in the film, all the guys on the ship are not sort of they don't warm to Captain Morell mm. um, initially. So maybe they're as well. They've got this other thing going in their heads. Well, this is an actor being our captain, so we can use that to our advantage so maybe there's a look that helped performances as well perhaps yeah and they know how to move through a ship so they aren't they, they yeah, aren't looking cack handed as an actor like they can move through a gangway they can go through doors they know how to open things and, and move equipment so yeah. it, it all gives it a bit more of an organic feel mm, it does so moving on to production this week the film is directed by dick powell now he was an actor turned director and he was known for playing hollywood hard men tough guys in the 40s um, and he directed Mitchum twice, actually, um, once in uh, Enemy Below in 57, but then also in The Hunters in 58. He was the director on that one. Um, and the uh, he also produced the film. Uh, the screenplay is by Wendell Mays, who, if you remember last week, he wrote Go Tell the Spartans. But he yes. also wrote. Yeah, exactly. He also wrote Von Ryan's Express and The Hunters 2. So there's a massive connection there. Um, and his this uh, Enemy Below was actually a second writing credit too. Uh, the film itself, though, that the nucleus of the story is actually based on a 1956 novel written by uh, Royal Naval Officer Dennis Rayner. Now, he got a DSC and bar during the war. And he wrote a book called Escort, uh, The Battle of the Atlantic, which was a, a memoir. He also wrote um, other... Uh, naval fiction such as the crippled tanker um, and these films were also made into oh. uh, saturday night audio dramas um, by the bbc in the 60s but the film changes the story from a british destroyer from the hms hector to the uss haynes there's certain things the film changes to the book but i don't think there's there's not too much changed um, but i know the movie leans heavily into the good german trope um, mm. but we'll, we'll mm. talk about that later on so the, the budget was 1.9 million. It was made by 20th Century Fox. Cinematography was by Harold Rosson. He was 
prolific. He got uh, Oscar nominations for The Wizard of Oz, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. He also did the cinematography oh. on Command Decision. So he's no stranger to, to making a film look nice. And I think the, the cinematography in this is one of its strengths. Absolutely. Filmed in Cinemascope with Jalux Colour. It's got that real sort of 50s Technicolor look to it. It's really nice. I, I love films that it does, it does. That look like that. Filmed at sea on the Pacific Ocean, just off of, uh, just off Hawaii, on the uh, Buckley class USS Whitehurst. And a lot, and as Matt said, lots of the crew were used as extras. And the film had its premiere date on the 25th of December 1957. It was released in the UK um, in ja- late January, February 1958. And it won an, an Oscar for Best Special Effects for Walter Rossi. And I think the effects work is, is very strong. Justified. Justified, very strong. So, uh, as always, we have a retro review um, from the Daily Mirror. We, we, we should be sponsored by them at this point. <laughs> I'll just read you. Sponsored by 1950s editions of the Daily Mirror. <laughs> yeah, brought to you by. <laughs> Brilliant. So, the reviewer is Donald Zeck. This review came out on January 10th, 1958. The uh, headline reads... Be in at the kill. Poised for the kill on the rolling gale whipped South Atlantic is the American escort destroyer. Deep in the eerie darkness below is a German submarine. Both of them helped by uncanny electronic eyes and ears. They they know precisely each other's position. But who will strike first and when or how? This is the tense dynamic opening to The Enemy Below, which stars Robert Mitchum and Kurt Jurgens. It begins a battle, not so much between two ships, but between two men. Each probes into the other's mind, searching, anticipating, gambling. Mitchum portrays City Street Sailor, who still has to win his battle spurs, and the respect of the destroyer crew that he commands. To him, the U-boat presents the stark, simple challenge of war, kill or be killed. To Jürgens, as the whiskey-swilling German submarine commander, the battle is merely an intellectual exercise, with death just an irksome risk. And so each tries to outsmart and outwit and outshoot the other in the most thrilling naval picture since the cruel sea. Set your compasses, friends, and go. Okay, a couple of points on that one. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't agree that it's the most thrilling since the cruel sea. Oof. And cruel sea's got, got, you know, that's a high bar to, to put there. It also, is, it is. Mitchum is a, is a veteran destroyer captain. His ship was sunk under him in the North Atlantic. He isn't a civvy. He was on a freighter before that. Um, he was merchant marine. He was exactly. So he's not that. That that the reviewer does need to watch the film again there. But no, that was a good review though. That, that's succinct. I like it. I like it. Just a couple mm. of points for me. <laughs> that's fine. No, I, I like the review. It was a, it was a good one. The Vanity Fair's review. I was going to use it, but it was very bland. They just talked mm. about literally that just the plot in a very bland way they weren't as um, colorful as donald was so that's why i chose that one reviewing writing writing a, a review of something like that is is it's an art form in itself really it is yeah but as always in our newish kind of feature if you've been listening the last couple of weeks we ask for your one word reviews and this week we have rob shipman says salty david patterson is ramtastic nick champion says suspenseful ad bond goes with deep Brian Williams says watches. Uh, Goonie Bird Drone on Twitter says Mariner. Dr. Stephen Maturin says Vassabom. It seems like everyone loves this film when it, whenever you bring it up. We've been asked a few times when we're going to cover it, and it, it, it seems like it's a real crowd-pleasing film, I think. I enjoyed it. I did enjoy it, I will admit. And you can get oh, involved oh, yeah. with, with that new feature, guys, if you follow us on Twitter at Fighting on Film. Uh, we, we're going to do that most weeks, I think. Yeah, I think we've that, that'll probably go out most Mondays, most Monday evenings. Mm. Um, and then I think as well, there's a the little connection as well. I was looking with a Star Trek episode that lampoons yes. off the plot of this movie. I mean, I know you're, you're the you're the Star Trek fan, so I was going to ask you to fill us in on that one. I am a bit of a Trekkie, yeah. So, it, it yeah, it does. It forms the basis of, of Balance of Terror, which is... Actually, I have a, have a, have a fan art poster of that on my wall about the, the frame. It's quite nice. Um, that makes me sound sadder than I really am. But I am a Trekkie. So. You'll have to get that up on the Twitter for everyone to see. I will do. I will do. Um, but, you know, it's a great episode. And and it takes the premise of, of Hunter and Hunted. And the, the, the German submarine becomes a Romulan warbird, which is cloaked. So it's invisible. And yep. the, the destroyer becomes the Enterprise with William Shatner as Captain Kirk. And they hunt one another. And it... 
it, it hits some of those beats that the film hits where you know it's um mutual uh, respect for each other's abilities and it's a hard fought tense battle yeah but yeah that it's it's interesting that they they took inspiration for the teleplay for that one mm. i think it's it can be like you know obviously it's a a tale between two men in war you know not, mm. not really they're not fighting with they're fighting each other with their with their minds so i guess it, it can translate quite well actually I, I can see why it would so to give you a rundown on the plot briefly if you've not seen the movie um, the film documents the USS Haynes as it squares off against the German U-boat in the South Atlantic in a, in a game of cat and mouse. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? It follows um, it follows the the destroyer as they pick up the U-boat on on sonar. Uh, mm. No, I think they pick it up on radar first, don't they? Um, and then it, it, I think it, they do, uh, yeah. And then it submerges, and yeah, it's the cat and mouse game, and it's it's been done a number of times before um, in other films and novels etc but i like the tension it brings there's some of it's a little bit flat in places but we'll talk about that a little bit more as we move through the film but yeah mm. I, that is the basic pitch and it's it's all done within 24 hour period um yep and it it shows the crew almost excited to finally see some action doesn't it yeah they're all moaning about how you know i think one of them even says he, he does the classic oh i'd like to see some action and you're like oh yeah you know, foreshadowing the crew's a little bit bored i think you know they're all they're all just going through the motions and they've they're unsure about the new captain because he's come from being sunk on a u-boat and he still hasn't recovered and you don't actually see robert mitchum for about 10 minutes you just hear his voice or you mm -hmm. hear you hear commands he's previously given um, and then you hear him through the through the, the little microphones they have and I think that's quite an interesting way to sort of do your movie where even though Robert Mitchell and Kurt Jurgens are your main stars, to not I always like it when films don't show you them initially. It's like kind of like how Tinker Taylor sold a spy. You don't see in the Gary Oldman pitch, you don't see him for about half an hour. I like that, you know, then Mitchum comes in and you see him and you're like, oh, is this this sort of like stocky, sort of not ordinary. pudgy, but it's like yeah. ordinary guy. You know, although Mitchum is this chiselled sort of De Niro-esque tough man, it, it, in this film, I think he really now's sort of playing like a sort of everyman character. I don't. He never felt like he was giving it so much bravado and and like a daring do attitude to it. He just felt like a normal guy, especially when he's chatting to the doctor. Those conversations just feel like he'd have those conversations with the men on his freighter. You know, him being in the Navy makes no difference to his actual personality. He just wants to get in the war. The the interesting part of that that sequence with the conversations with the doctor is that he has more than ample reason to make this a Captain Ahab yeah. esque Moby Dick sort of tale where he's obsessed with with sinking a U-boat. And it that isn't how the character goes. The character's accepted the death of his wife. So uh it ex he explains to the doctor that he and his wife, he just married um, an English lady and he was, they were on their way over to the U S so she could be uh, somewhere safe while he went back and, and was on the freighters and the, the, the freighter was, was torpedoed and split in half. Yeah. And he watched her go down with the other half in seconds. And you can only imagine the trauma that would create, Yeah, but he's so matter of fact, he's compartmentalized it, I think. And he's there to do a job. And he comes across as a very competent commander. The orders yeah. he gives are competent. So when when people ask him if he wants to do something, because perhaps they think he's, um, you know, Green hasn't done this before. Like there's a yeoman that comes up and asks if he wants to send off a, a radio message, a report. Um, yeah. And he says, no, we're going to maintain radio silence. And it's those little moments where you, you gather that he knows what he's doing. And then the crew along the way kind of go, oh, he does know what he's doing. Yeah, he like builds their confidence up, doesn't he? I think after the after the first engagement where they they damage the U boat or they see the U boat off successfully, make him dive deeper. Mm. You see, there's this little section where the guys look around at each other, they're like, "Oh, this guy doesn't know what he's doing." Yeah, yeah. you know, go out, and it's when they when the ship turns to avoid the first torpedo attacks. Mitchum's character works out where how to turn because he's done it before, mm -hmm. obviously on the freighters. Um, the, I think you get the, a little exchange with some of the the crew, and they're like how do you suppose the captain knew when to turn? And the, and the guy goes, well, that's why he's the captain and you're not. 
So I just yeah. like the sort of they they grow the confidence of him. It's a little bit like in Greyhound, actually. I think the plot in Greyhound is very sort of: is this guy going to be a good captain or not? Um, should mm. we trust him? They hit they hit similar beats. Hit similar beats exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One thing I do like about the movie is how the men are very matter of fact when it comes to war. They're very, you know, they're not like your typical um, soldiery characters in war movies where, you know, oh, I'm fighting the Nazis. I'm fighting the good fight. They're very realists about war. So and there's some great dialogue in there. I think one of the things a movie is should be heralded for is its dialogue. And you've got Morel who's been through it already. Mm-hmm. And he's talking to the doctor about how he feels about conflict. He says, the doctor says, well, in time, we'll get back to our own stuff again. The war will get swallowed up and it'll feel like nothing happened. And then Morel says, yes, but it won't be the same as it was. We won't have that feeling of permanency we had before. We'll have learned a hard truth. Uh, And he goes on to say, there's no end to misery and destruction. You cut the head off the snake and it grows another one. You cut that off, you find another. You can't kill it. It's something within ourselves. You can call it the enemy if you want to, but it's part of us. We're all men really like that like the the man's cruelty to man aspect of the yeah it's deep isn't it it's and you get you get more of that with Jürgen's character as well and he's chatting with uh Heine, his second in command uh after yeah. after a watch he has a number of observations where he's a u-boat veteran he was in the in the u-boat service during world war one as well uh, as a young sailor and he has a number of observations where they've taken the human out of war because he looks through the periscope they can read off the distance and speed of a, of a thing and it's fed into a targeting calculator and someone works it out yeah. with, with um, slide rules and stuff. And then they know exactly when to loose the torpedo and it's removed some of the art from it and, and given it more of a, um, a scientific yeah. um, inhuman aspect, which I suppose when you come to total war, that is something that happens. Um, Very true. It's not, yeah. There's, there's an interesting contrast in this film where it's, n- it's set up as captain v captain in a almost chivalric um, hark back to knights on the battlefield. Uh, who's going to tilt first, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, but in the end of the day, these men are c- commanding warships that are capable of sinking each other with ease, you know, depth charges, torpedoes, six inch guns, whatever, you know, exactly, they have yeah. this, their disposal and, the, the scene I really liked um, was when you begin to see them spar with one another. Jürgens is thinking, well, I'll fire the two aft torpedo tubes because Mitchum is gambled. He can get the U-boat commander to fire off his two aft torpedo tubes, which he can't reload at sea um, mm. in order to, to give him a bit of an advantage later on during the battle. And that's, yeah. that's when he, it, the whole knowing when to turn comes in and, he he offers like his his beam to him, a uh, perfect target for a, for a submarine, and then once once he 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 times how long he thinks that's going to take for them to do different you know elements, for how long the U boat captain's going to take to decide, how long it takes to get the tubes ready, how long um, the torpedoes will be in the water for, and he times it down to like we'll we'll give them twelve minutes and then we'll turn, um, and, it, yeah. and it works. It's it's very clever and. Um, Mm. But as I was saying, so Jürgens' dialogue with Heine is really interesting because he talks about um, he's sick of this war. It's not a good war. It's something he repeats a couple of times in that in that monologue. Yeah. Um, there's no honor in this war. If we die, we die without cause. So he's obviously mm. not a died in the war Nazi. Um, and there's there's more of that no. to talk about in a moment, isn't there? But yeah, it's sure. really interesting that he he was so comfortable with his his executive officer second in command that he could air these voices you know these opinions you get and the impression that they're old friends don't you because he calls him high knee and they have all these conversations you feel like they've been battling since the start of the war that's how i mm. how i saw it and it lays out their character and their dynamic really well for later in the film because obviously the movie is it, it's the same movie just shown from different as like different people so you get the sort of the same feeling on the on the destroyer where uh, Mitchum's got a win over his crew and uh, von Stahlberg has sort of got a win over his crew as well in the same way. They've got to prove to the crews that it, what they're doing is worth it. And it becomes less about 
war itself and it becomes more about a battle of wits. I think I can't remember what who what veteran said it. I can't remember why I read this, but I remember I was reading something about the Battle of Britain and then pilot said, I wasn't trying to shoot the man in the aircraft. I was trying to shoot the aircraft. You feel that way with this movie. I, I feel like they're trying to stop the destroyer and they're trying to stop the U-boat because of what it represents rather than the people on board. As the movie goes on, we see this sort of respect for each other and how they are as sailors and how they are as people. You see it build through throughout. So when they finally meet each other and they look at each other, they, I think to the two men sort of, they see themselves in each other, don't they, at the end there? Uh, it's quite powerful at the end, really. It's interesting. The I mean, we might as well talk about the end and the differences and, sure. and some, the fact that two endings were filmed. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. Hello, I'm Al Murray, and you're listening to Fighting on Film, the world's number one war film podcast. Spoilers, everybody. At the end, the the two encounter one another on their respective burning vessels because they they in fact rare for a for a war movie they they destroy each other's vessels, don't they? The the destroyer ends up um, ramming across the the top of the the, the u-boat and uh, after after the u-boats actually manage to torpedo the the destroyer and Mitchum manages to to hit the destroyer with, with a few rounds from from its guns and then rams the the vessel and Jürgens' character decides to to blow up his u-boat um, mm. so they all abandon their respective ships and the two encounter one another from their respective decks and they Jürgens offers him a salute which uh, Mitchum returns. Um, yeah. And then Mitchum leaves him to to rescue his second in command, Heine, um, but thinks better of it and comes back and helps him. Uh, throws yes. across a line and helps him, helps Jürgen, Jürgen's get across as well. That's very different from what is seen in the actual book itself. Um, yeah, the book's very different. Yeah. So there, there's a brilliant um, BBC radio play of this which was part of their Saturday night theatre block and it came out in 1963 and Leo Gen plays Morel uh, and Gerard Hines plays von Stahlberg and in that one this, it follows the original book a lot more closely with the British crew against the German uh, U-boat and mm. at the end they're in the life raft and um, they have a fight uh, because uh, von Stahlberg says you're my prisoners now and Leo again as uh, Morel is like, well, what do you mean? Like, it's just, it's absurd to him that after all this, you know, cat and mouse thing that now because yeah. both ships have been destroyed by each other, that you can't work out why, and that you know, why would you want to take me prisoner now when clearly neither of us have won sort of thing. And they have a fight and there's some great dialogue where, Starbuck's like, you're going to fight me like a common sailor? And Leo Gen's like, I'll fight you however I like. Put your put them up, you know, sort of thing. It's very sort of Queensbury rules. It's really good. If you haven't listened to the play version, it's on YouTube. It's great. Leo Gen's fantastic in it. Re really, really fantastic production values, as I like the movie. That aside, uh, Dick Powell filmed two ver endings of the movie. The first version was both men are killed, but that was played to audiences, like test screenings. And they thought it was too bleak. So he filmed another version where both men saved each other and made it away and became friends. So I wanted to ask you, Matt, having seen the film now, what ending would you have preferred? I, I like the ending that we have because it adds more tension to an already tense film. It gives a perhaps more optimistic for the human race ending mm. than both of them being killed uh, or killing Agreed. one another does. Uh, I think after the, the tension of, of the cat and mouse chase and the hunt, the fact that we had a renewed tension from them helping one another and whether the U-boat would explode or, and the destroyer sink underneath them. I think, yeah, I, I like the one we get. I, I, do. I, I do. I agree with the 1950s um, target audience. Yeah. Considering how much we've gone, how much we've learned about these men, you know, I don't actually feel like they want to kill each other. I just feel like they want to stop each other's respective craft. I don't think they want to kill. No, well, there's there's no element of personal. No, um, exactly. I don't feel interaction like, is there. So yeah, even though Stolberg's saying like we must kill him, I think he's talking about the destroyer. He's not talking about Morella yes, as a person. It's a more general him killing them both off. I would have felt shortchanged. 
I would have felt a little bit yes. disappointed because it, it is very bleak. I don't know what I don't know the actual plot of the the, the other alternate ending either. I can't. I, I couldn't find it. it. I'm anywhere. not sure if it exists um, out there at all. But I w- I wonder if they if they'd been killed while trying to help one another, that would have added another layer. Perhaps, yeah, perhaps. Maybe, you know, mm. getting with the, the detonators going, maybe one of them couldn't get out or something, maybe that would have been good. Yeah. But no, I'm pleased we get the ending that we do, because the sequence where they're talking about, you know, would you, you know, would you, th- I don't think I'll throw the rope next time, and they share a lucky strike, and Jürgen says, I think you would, and then it ends. Yes, yeah. Such a, it's just, it, it, as I said before, it's two juggernaut actors who really put their all into these performances. Mm. Just at, coming together at the end, you know, to just respect each other. I think that's really interesting for a war film to do because sometimes in these war films, you miss that human element of the, of the picture. And I think it's quite, it's a strong representation of, of men in war and how they react to it. So this week, I think we've got a very short alley tally, and then we're into our favourite scenes. It's time for alley tally on fighting on film. So this week, uh, I looked into the actual ship that the, the film was um, the film used for the the USS Haynes, and it was portrayed in the film by the USS Whitehurst, as we said. And the the ship, the the actual ship, the proper ship, uh, the Whitehurst was launched in 1943. She served an escort for convoys in the South Atlantic. She was part of Task Force 54, protecting transport ships during the invasion of Okinawa in 1945. And she also served in the Korean War too. And she earned six battle stars in World War II, three in Korea, and she ended her life as a target ship and was sunk in 1971 by the submarine Trigger. So that's a little history there of the, uh, the USS Whitehurst. Ironic, but yeah. Yeah. But it's it's like the Cruel Sea, isn't it? Because just having it filmed at sea, I know there's model work in certain sections where the boat's on fire and things like that, but just being able to see Mitchum and the crew interact with the real ship, you know, you've got the actual extras who know what dials to turn, they know what buttons to press, they know how to stand, they know how to drink their coffee on a ship. You know, it's all those little things that really make this mm-hmm. movie work. It, 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 it's almost like it's the American version of the Crawl Sea almost for me. But filmed at sea, you have that extra, yeah, that extra authenticity to the movie. Yes, the U-boat sets are a little bit big, Yes, the U-boat crew aren't as dirty as they should be. You know, it's not dash boot levels, but for 1957, it's a decent portrayal of a U-boat crew. Um, I really enjoyed it. And I also love seeing those um, Mark II talker helmets, like the big sort of Star Wars-esque. Oh, yeah, with the with the, um, the, the headsets underneath them. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I like seeing that. It, 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 I just think they're really cool. Um and also, it's nice to see US Navy represented going up against U-boats because we don't, I'm not saying we don't know that that didn't happen, but it's not represented a lot. When we think of the Atlantic War, we think of the Royal Navy or the Canadian Navy taking on the U-boats. We don't necessarily think of the Americans taking on the U-boats as much. No, there's a few. There's a few, but not many. I agree. Mm. I, one of the things I liked um, was, uh, I like the scenes where they're looking at the sonar. And the yeah, it's the always nice. I really like that. I liked I liked the bit where um they were in the the C and C room, and you know, he was popping up and down from the bridge, uh, getting reports. I liked all the intricacies and and the, the practicalities yeah. of that. It's nice. I, I really thought that was cool. Um, but yeah, th- it's not a, it's not an alley in the conventional it's not a kit sense. Heavy of... movie, is it? But it's no, no. But the, it's cool. I like I like I agree. I like the number the, the number two helmets that you mentioned there. And it's cool. Um there's lots of nice little sequences with the depth charges which are up close one of the poor seamen gets his fingers cut off and there's a great scene where he's in the the medical bay with, with him afterwards and he's had to have his fingers amputated and he says don't worry we'll, we'll get you back uh to Sibby street and you'll be you'll be back at work in no time and he was i was a i was a clockmaker and and mitchum's face in that scene is great another thing i really liked and i had to go and find it um was apparently i read that the an actual copy of the enemy below by Rayner is in the um I think it's like the mess rooms bookshelf 
um, when you All when right. the, the movie starts. So I went back and I found it. And it's you can just about make it out. It's really cool to see. It's a nice little nod. Oh, nice. Get that post on yeah, Twitter. Nice after this. Find, yeah, find it again. Nice little nod there. But yeah, I mean, as far as Ali Tally goes, there's not much kit in this one, but there's some nice um, destroyer action. So if you're a Navy fan, this one's for you. It feels authentic. It, the, it does. The the destroyer crew feel authentic in in the, the uniforms and the way they're moving because yep. we're moving we're moving towards um, some some final thoughts on the on the on the flip side of this. But as you mentioned earlier, the the it's perhaps not das boot levels of of grime, but it, it doesn't detract. And they make some efforts towards that. They um, uh, Jurgens is wearing a, an open shirt for for a lot of it, mm. and the guys are sweaty. They're grimy. Um, it, it, it there is there is a, efforts to portray some of that you know unpleasantness of being in a, cooped up in a u-boat so it, it definitely it definitely works no i agree i think it does it, it's very very authentic feeling and you do get a sense of claustrophobia from the u-boat sequences it's not quite as bad as in um battle for the river plate where the interiors of the ships are like massive living rooms in mansions like that that really annoys yeah, it's like me. a cruise line yeah, yeah exactly it's not quite that bad you do that's i think one of the things where filming on the destroyers really helped the movie because it does feel claustrophobic it feels small it feels like you're in a small ship they had albert beck a former um german u-boat submarine um sailor who who was one of the technical advisors and then the the captain of the uh, the destroyer the white Hurst, was also uh, a technical advisor on there as well yeah he was um and he, i think he gets a credit at the end as as an advisor um, and I think he also has a tiny cameo as well as a ship's yeah. engineer. And, and of course, uh, the, the US Navy helped out with the production too. Of course, well, they provided the destroyer. Hello, Robbie here. Did you know you can support the podcast on Patreon? Join the supporting cast today and gain access to exclusive perks, such as discount codes, our monthly Patreon film votes, and the chance to get exclusive merchandise before anyone else. Search Fighting on Film on Patreon or find the link on our website. Thank you. Now back to the show. So Rob, what's your favourite scene? So my favourite scene this week is I like the scene where Mitchum gives the briefing to his chiefs and his officers. And it's after mm. um, it's after uh, Jürgens has dived as, as deep as he can go, sort of outwit them. And he gives this short briefing where he says, look, you know, we've expended a third of our depth charges um, we can we can keep up this routine of of staying off him, then going towards him, dropping some depth charges, and coming off again. It will be slow monotonous work, but I think it's the best thing to do. And they're going to try and force um, Jurgens to surface. And he says maybe if we can force him to service surface, we can shoot it out with him. Yeah, it's a, it becomes a holding action, doesn't it? For the for the uh, there's a couple of destroyers that are trying to catch up with them. By this point in the movie, Mitchum's has proven to the crew that he knows what he's doing. So he just lays it yeah. out in terms, in no no uncertain terms. This is what we're going to do, and it will work. And they believe him. But then after this, you get this great montage where you see this, because Mitchum talks about the strain of a U-boat crew under depth charge attack. And then you get this beautiful, really, really well um, choreographed uh, montage of there's a clock on the U-boat, and it starts at 3 o'clock when Mitchum says their attack runs are going to start. And it, and it goes into hours and stuff. Uh, it goes into hours and then it cracks. And then the U-boat crew start to crack and you see Mitchum's face and you see Jürgen's face. You see the crews, different crews doing their thing. And then after that sequence, you get the U-boat crew actually cracking where the, the guy that's working in the torpedo tubes, well, he goes a bit mad with a spanner because um, he's, he's, he's yeah. properly cracked. But I just really like that sequence. I like a montage when they're used effectively. Um, and this is one of the better ones. It reminded me of the, um, the montage in in battleground where they finally get their their ammunition and they can fight back yeah i agree some of the other bits where they try and show that tension of them waiting out um the depth charge attacks were a little bit flat in places but certainly i think that the montage worked really well and towards the end the tension really does ramp yes it does Um, for me uh my favorite scene comes from two of the film strengths the model work Mm and the uh, the cinematography and the special effects. And there's a little scene where Jürgens and the Ubo are trying to, I think they're trying to fool uh, the sonar operator into thinking that they're... Uh, like a false echo. The Yes, a false echo. And they try, and, they try and hide underneath the destroyer 
and then Jurgens takes it to the very furthest depths that the, the the submarine can 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 withstand, and eventually he settles on the bottom. Yeah. And there's a brilliant shot of they're waiting for the U-boat to make its move because it can't stay down there forever. Um, they're waiting for w- either one or the other to to, to crack first and, and move and try and bring the other out. And there's a great shot where it pans across some of the crew and everyone's looking fairly tense, not knowing what's going on uh, aboard the destroyer, that is. And then uh, I think it's the cook's mate is, is fishing. He's got a fishing line over the side and the camera pans across him. There's a little bit of dialogue between him and um, I think it's the chief. Um, uh, and the camera pans down the fishing line. Mm. Oh, that's beautiful, isn't it? submerges below the the waterline you see the 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 hull of the destroyer disappear and then the camera pans down a little more down to this really beautiful shot of the u-boat settled on the bottom mm. um and then the the shadow of the of the the destroyer outlining it reminded me of uh you know like a flatfish when it goes into the sand and it's trying to make itself look like mm-hmm. sand it reminded me of that but the model work on that yes it, beautiful it amazing yeah yeah, I saw some pictures when I was researching of, of the of the uh, production team actually making the the U boat models, and it's just oh, fantastic for that one shot, just that what just one throwaway shot. Really, the nice. director's gone. I would like to do this shot where we pan down, and see it on the bottom. The the amount of work that must have gone into creating that, and then also in the cutting process of getting that pan down the fishing line into the where it goes into special effects where it's going through the water and then looking down onto the seabed seamless it's amazing it's brilliant filmmaking really well deserved oscar i think for this one the, the effects are really hold up well don't they that's what sort of ramp levels it up more because there are as you said there are sections that can be a little bit flat where the, i didn't feel that much was going on but that i think that's the whole point isn't it because yeah yeah it's that 24 hour yeah, period it's a very methodical way of taking on a u-boat you got to you got to know when to. <laughs> I was going to start rapping there, like um, you got to defend and attack, <laughs> you know, like um, like, <laughs> like to the bonds well, rap the, well, the motion there, yeah. But it is though. <laughs> you you have to know when to defend and when to attack and when to hold off mm-hmm. and, and and use your depth charges. It's just some really great sequences in the movie. I think my other favorite part is is the actual climactic battle at the end where um, Jürgens takes the decision to surface once he's managed to hit the ship yeah. with a torpedo. Mitchum makes his last gamble and he, he orders uh, mattresses brought out on deck and set on fire to make it all that ship's more damaged than it is. Yeah, yeah. Ship's going to sink, but it's, it's going to be an hour or so beforehand. And Jürgen sees this through the, the periscope and he decides, well, I'll surface and I'll finish him off with gunfire. That's when Mitchum strikes and that they open fire and you've got this climactic section where the, the, they, the two collide and, and we get this um, more great model work. Yeah. The ship going over the U boat and the, yeah, it's it's yeah. not as good as the panning shot, it's but the, it's still really good. It's the sounds that make it. So there's not a lot of soundtrack in this movie. There is at the end, and there's some at the start, but the majority of the movie is diegetic sound. It's what the crew hears, what the people hear, not what is added in. That's what diegetic means for anyone who mm. doesn't know. The creak and the the tearing sound you get the ripping sound of the the yeah. two ships going over each other is just so the hull going over the top of the U-boat so well is, done isn't yeah. it love it really great although it gets let down a little bit when the destroyer the finally does explode and the u-boat goes up the, the sound effects there just didn't quite work for me i i didn't think they be a bit more powerful yeah, yeah it sounded more like someone saying oh firecrackers than a little you know, bit a, a deep ordnance exploding that kind of thing So, um, final thoughts territory again. I enjoyed it. I did enjoy it. it. It isn't on exactly the same par with Cruel Sea for me. No. Or um, I, it compares well to others in the genre. It compares well to, to Cruel Sea. Yeah. It compares really well to, to Greyhound, probably the most recent adaptation of something like this. It's it's the actors, isn't it? And and the cinematography, some of that really great dialogue. Yes. And the special effects. And the model work, they they come together to create something quite special. I think you're right. Uh, I, it, 
it feels like a tense cat and mouse hunt. Yeah. And then there's there's some punchy, really interesting and, and quite cerebral dialogue. Mm. Jurgen's in a, a 1977 New York Times interview later said, this was an important picture for me because it was the first time after the war in which a German officer was not interpreted as a freak. Yeah, I'll probably, I'll go for that actually. It's probably one of the first times. And bef- before we began the recording of the show, this week we were talking about the good German mm. and that trope and how it evolved and uh, and how that isn't actually in the source material of the book itself. It isn't in there. It's, it alludes it's something to that it. it. I don't think it's, it's as on mm. the nose as the movie is. No. No. Jürgen's in, in that scene with Heine in his uh, in his uh, his berth, which he wouldn't have had. He would have had a little cubby with a cat. Yeah. Because that U-boat was too big. Yeah. That's one. That's one of my one of the things. There's a couple of a couple of technical bits that aren't quite right. The, the apparent scale of the ships is apparently not quite on point, but nothing that you would go, oh, that's wrong. No, there's nothing. Nothing draws it's just you out. Little, little nitpicking things that people have, have mentioned online when I was reading around on it, and it, it's just a matter of scaling, I think. Yeah. But as I was saying, I I think the the interesting thing is that Jürgen's decided to take that dialogue and really lean into the mm. this is not a good war no his ugly war speech and is there's amazing like just just from the way it's written it the way it's delivered it's and yeah. it's paralleled with that sequence where they're on the bottom and they're trying to wait it out and a guy's reading Mein Kampf one of the young officers yeah. and it and him and, and Heine share it a look at one another and they kind of roll their eyes in like a, a joking mm. sort of way because that's not that's not what they're here for. They're here as career sailors. Yeah. They they're U-boat men, and it's that good German fighting for their country sort of aspect to it, rather than an ideology. I saw that. I saw that as well. What good does a card carrying Nazi do you in a U-boat? That doesn't help you at all. Do you know what I mean by that? It's like it's not. It's not that important in the situation. Well, it's certainly not important to them. Yeah. I yeah. Know what you mean. Yeah. It, but I think the film has that an interesting place within that evolution of the, the good German mm. and the, the change in, in the depiction, moving away from some of the depictions during the war as depra- every, every German was depraved and evil to it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And then some films go even further and it becomes almost revisionist, apologetic, that kind of thing. I think within within that, I think it's got a really interesting position. I think it strikes a good balance for 57, I think. In, in it, in it, I think it holds up I, I would well. agree there, yeah. Yeah. I'm not rooting for either cause, but you can cert- you can certainly feel for the characters. Doesn't really bring the cause into it. Doesn't does it? really. No, it doesn't. That's the strength of it. I think it's more of a a film about two men, two crews, pitting themselves against one another yeah. than an ideological piece. And I like the fact that they bring that in and they try and highlight there were different opinions and, and different amounts of uh, you know fervence and mm. and belief and people were fighting this war that had different ideas. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I did enjoy the film, I have to say. The last, my takeaway really is that, I've said it a few times, but Mitch and Jürgen's make this movie. It's like, for me, The Cruel Sea doesn't work without Ericsson, without Sinden, without Baker, same as The Enemy Below mm-hmm. doesn't work without Mitch and Jürgen's because they bring, they bring a stoicness. They bring a world-weary-esque sense to the their performances and they, they really they really are strong performances i can't see why that mitchams or jürgens weren't part for any award for this movie because i think it's a real shame um i also like the anti-war um sentiment to some of the way they're talking how mitchum says about the snake of the head of the snake being removed and you know the the, the yeah. evil is in us it's not in the war itself human condition. the human condition i like that as well mm. and the movie's just well made i mean it, it took me a few watches to finally go right i get what this movie means because when i watched it when i was young i was like well, this movie's really long and boring but since watching it a few times in the last couple of weeks and actually i think it's really well paced it's a slow burn if you, if you like that nuanced look at men in war this movie is for you if you enjoy the cruel sea this one's for you as well more than just a u-boat versus a, a ship story quite enjoyable very enjoyable do seek it out if you haven't seen it so yet again we want to thank our patrons for picking this one next month there'll be four more movies for you to pick i thought it was going to be 800 but it was this I, i'm happy to say it was this maybe I next enjoy. month matt i think I, there, there weren't any weak films on that list we put up this month. there were no weak choices here yeah as always you can check out the patreon if you haven't before uh, go on patreon slash fighting on film you'll find us there 
check out any episodes you haven't listened to yet on our website fightingonfilm.com do leave us a written review on iTunes because we'd love to hear them we'd love to read them out on the show and thanks for listening as always guys and we'll catch you next week thanks guys bye bye everyone